Good morning, Grayton Community Church. It's lovely to be with you again this morning. I'm reading a verse from Deuteronomy, and then the main scripture reading will come from the Gospel of John. So um, the Deuteronomy verse is just uh, one verse, and um, it's Deuteronomy 18, verse 15. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. That is the Old Testament. And then if we turn to the New Testament, to the Gospel of John, of uh, John's Gospel, chapter 6, reading from verse 1 to verse 21. It's a story of Jesus feeding the 5,000. Sometime after this, Jesus crossed to the far shore of the Sea of Galilee, that is, the Sea of Tiberias. And a great crowd of people followed him because they saw the signs he had, he had performed by healing those who were ill. Then Jesus went up on a mountainside and sat down with his disciples. The Jewish Passover festival was near. When Jesus looked up and saw a great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? He asked this only to test him, for he already had in mind what he was going to do. Philip answered him, It would take more than a, than a half a year's wages to buy enough bread for each one to have a bite. Another of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, spoke up. Here is a boy with five small barley loaves and two small fish. But how far will they go amongst so many? Jesus said, Make the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, and they sat down. About, about 5,000 men were there. Jesus then took the loaves, gave thanks, and distributed to those who were seated as much as they wanted. He did the same with the fish. When they had all had enough to eat, he said to the disciples, Gather the, piece, the pieces that are left over. Let nothing be wasted. So they gathered them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces of five barley loaves left over by those who had eaten. After the, after the people saw the sign Jesus performed, they began to say, Surely this is the prophet who has come into the world. Jesus, knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force, withdrew again to a mountain by himself. Verse 16. When evening came, his disciples went to the lake, where they got into a boat and set off across the lake for Capernaum. By now it was dark, and Jesus had not yet joined them. A strong wind was blowing, and the waters grew rough. When they had rowed about three or four miles, they saw Jesus approaching the boat, walking on the water. And they were frightened. But he said to them, It is I, don't be afraid. Then they were willing to take him into the boat, and immediately the boat reached the shore where they were heading. This is God's word. Let us always be grateful for it. Good morning once again. You know, you all look so much better when you smile. From, uh, uh, believe me, I'm, what, I'm looking at you. <laughs> Sorry, I'm knocking out. I'll try and smile as well. <laughs> you know, since we last saw each other, there's been another storm. And what a storm it was. And some of us are still picking up the pieces. Now, during the very time that the impact of the storm was being felt in Gordon's Bay, it so happened that I was in my study working my way through this early part of John's Gospel where we are told that the disciples found themselves in a storm. And the words recorded for us in verse 18 there, a strong wind was blowing and the waters grew rough. Made me wonder whether the storm 
that the disciples found themselves in was anything like the storm, that great storm that John Newton, that we sang about early on, that him that he wrote, Amazing Grace, found himself in. Brian Edwards wrote through in the book, Through Many Dangers, he described the storm in these, with these words. The early hours of March 1748, none of us were around, eh? <laughs> proved to be a night of terror. The stiff westerly wind turned into a howling gale that ripped into the defenseless greyhound with gusts of 80 miles an hour and tossed the ship like a tiny cork from crest to trough between 30-foot walls of water. During the blackness of the night, a heavy sea crashed onto the deck and slid below. Newton washed from his bunk, staggered to the ladder with a cry of sailors in his ears that the ship was breaking up and it was sinking. He grasped the rail, the rail and hauled himself from the squelching cabin floor. Halfway up the ladder, Newton met the captain who ordered him to return to get hold of a knife. Newton released his hold, dropped back to the floor and went in search of a knife. A seaman shouldered past Newton and was immediately swept into a cold, choking grave. But Newton and a terrified crew had very little time to leisure and acknowledge this horrifying death. As the ship wallowed in the seas, they anticipated the same fate at any moment. Cold, frightened and hopeless, the sailors went through those duties that stern discipline had instilled in them over the years in a desperate fight for survival. You get the picture? Now those of you who are familiar with the stories of John Newton, will know that how God used this storm to change this man's life, to turn it completely around. God opened his eyes to see the truth about God and the truth about himself and just how much he needed God. And in a similar way, Jesus tells this story about him walking on a water and about the storm that the disciples found themselves in. He, that storm came about because Jesus wanted to open their eyes, the disciples' eyes, to see who exactly He is. And that it was safe for them to trust Him, in the, even in the fiercest of storms of life. Let's pray. Father, as we turn now to your word, we pray that you will help us to hear your voice in such a way that it will bring life to our souls. For Jesus' sake. Amen. So here's a, a storm and this inner storm, Jesus wants to reveal to them, the disciples, exactly who he is. Now the disciples have given up everything, their livelihood, to follow him. Jesus has sent them out on a mission to proclaim, to tell the people that the kingdom of God was at hand. And they were expecting that kingdom to be established at any moment. And now... Jesus performs this miracle of the feeding of the, the 5,000. You know, the Jews at that point of time were, it says it was the Passover, and they were thinking about the time when God delivered the Israelites from centuries of being in bondage, how God used the leadership of Moses to bring about that miraculous change in their lives, where they were rescued from that dominion, that opposition, oppression. 
They've been waiting for another prophet like Moses for thousands of years. And when the people saw this miraculous sign of the feeding of the 5,000, they began to say to themselves, Surely, this is the prophet who came into the world. The prophet of Deuteronomy 18. The one like Moses. Surely this is him. And then the Bible tells us, Jesus knowing that they intended to come and make him king by force. What did he do? Matthew, describing this very same incident, describes it like this. says, immediately, right after the feeding of the 5,000, immediately after that, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side. While he dismissed the crowd, and after he dismissed them, he went up into the mountainside to be by himself to pray. So when the crowd wanted to come and make him king, what did Jesus do? He walks away from the crowd and their political ambition to make him king. For they had not fully understood the significance, the full significance of this miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. And neither did his disciples. And so Jesus straight away took action to address this misconception as to who he is and what it is that he came to do in this world. You see, this miracle is far more than Jesus is just being a nice man who wants people to have a lunch. Of him being a powerful political leader who can free them from Roman oppression. He is not merely or only a great prophet like Moses. He wanted to confront them, show them who he really is. And he brings about this storm that they have to be in so he can reveal himself to them. The miracle of Jesus walking on the water is a sign, a miraculous sign that points to a mind-blowing reality. Jesus is about to show his closest followers who he is. He is God. He is Yahweh, Israel's God. He is the Creator God. He is the God of Exodus. And having shown him We'll see more how he does that later on. But he also wants to show them that because of who he is, that it's safe for them to trust him. So those two thoughts, to come to know him and to trust him, is why he performs this miracle. So they went across the lake. Jesus dismisses the crowd and they found himself in this great storm. Now friends, that's a great transition. Something quite unexpected. Can you think about it? Here they were with him feeding this 5,000 people. Being an excited crowd. Amidst that, at the admiration of this crowd. To be thrust into solitude, darkness, wind, waves, storm, anxiety, danger. It was an incredible change. Have you not found life to be like that? We sometimes on a mountain top, and then the next happen you say, "What?" Mm. You know, we would rather have cross a lake with calm weather, <coughs> don't you? When you're going holiday, favorable winds, and with Christ always by our side and the sun gently shining on our face. Like Sal and myself sat in garden yesterday when that happened. But it's not always like that, is it? You see, God wants us to come to know the truth about himself. And he wants us. He's busy doing something in our lives. And that is to show us what to value that will be of eternity. And so in the process of changing 
how we think about him, who he is, and what it is that he came to do, God may sometimes place us in situations, take us to places that we wouldn't choose to go by ourselves, in order to teach us lessons about him and about ourselves and about life that we could not learn in any other way. You know, trial, storms of life is part of the Christian life. By the way, this means yes. You know, Jesus knew all about what they were going through. And he appointed the storm. And he did so with a purpose in mind. Picture it. Our Lord came to the disciples as they were in that desperate fight for survival. They were rowing away. And what do they find? They find Jesus, the very waves that are tossing them all over the show. What does Jesus do? He's walking on them. And he hears them saying, It is I. Do not be afraid. If they had not been in the storm, they would have not been able to have witnessed how Jesus is the Lord of life. That he can walk on the waves. That he can bring peace to their hearts even in the midst of a terrible, terrible storm that they found themselves in. And so Jesus knew about this crowd. He knew what they were all about. He knew that they were living under the Roman rule and that they were being oppressed. They were, life was hard for them. We've all known times when life was hard for us, didn't we? Jesus knows about that. They were facing injustice. They faced daily exploitation by tax collectors for the Romans. They faced hunger, as we saw in the first part of John 6, when Jesus feeds them and responds to their hunger. And above all, he knew that they wanted to be set free from that Roman oppression. Jesus knew all of that. You know, many times people, under the weight of personal problems, an unhappy marriage maybe, or the cons overwhelming concerns for their children, a deep awareness that something, something vital is missing in their lives, facing health problems, Or facing the devastation that it comes as a result of sin, their sin or the sins of others. Under the weight of that, many turn to Jesus, hoping that he will miraculously change all of that for them. And we all do. The first thing I do when I got an upset tummy is I talk to the Lord about it. I said, Lord, uh, uh, I've got money for this now and I haven't got energy for this. Lord, help me. I'm sure you've done the same. We've all been there. And you know, we are full of hallelujahs for Jesus when things work out for us as we've had envisaged. But it doesn't always work out like that. Is it? Not for me. When things don't go away, in the case of some people, what they do, they then, as quickly as they turn to Jesus for help, they turn from Him. Often disappointed. Often confused and angry and bitter. You see, they have not understood who Jesus is. Focusing on all of that. They have never moved beyond that. They've never seen that their greatest need is Jesus himself. Who he is and what he's come to do is what they had to get a handle on, a firm handle on. They wanted Jesus to be the promised Messiah King who will improve their living conditions, who will deliver them from a Roman oppression. But Jesus was about to teach them that even though he was not the Messiah King, they have hoped for. That does not just change the fact 
that he is who he is, Lord of Lord, as we sang, the unchangeable I am. You see, Jesus had come into our world not to be a proud, political, popular king. To be admired and to be ministered to, but he came to minister and to give his life as a ransom for many. Are you still with me? I see some of you are going into the land of Nod. And I just want to get you out of the land of Nod. So I don't know how to do it, but I'm just doing this now that you can wake up again. Jesus comes to us that we may know who he is, not as we hope him to be. You know, many want to follow Jesus for self-serving purposes. But Jesus wants us to follow him for eternal purposes. We too need to ask ourselves when it comes to Jesus, who is this that even the waves and the sea obey him? Who is this? And once we know who that is, we will then know. We will then embrace his purpose for our lives. The reason why he came into this world, his purpose as our purpose for life. The Apostle Paul writes, Jesus had come into the world to die for all. Even the Romans, the Jews had to realize that. That those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You know, even the disciples didn't get it right. Right after Jesus asked the crucial question, but who do you say I am? If I ask you that, remember, we're always coming back to that one. Jesus told them that he had to go to Jerusalem where he would suffer many things, be killed and be raised on the third day. But Peter took Jesus aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block for me. You are not setting your mind on God's interest, but man's. You see, Peter had a wrong conception of Jesus that didn't include the cross. Sadly, that common misconception is a common misconception that many of our colleagues and family and friends have about Jesus. They want Jesus for what, they can do, what he can do for them. But they don't want a Jesus that is associated, that includes the cross. And when you come across somebody like that, may God give you the grace and the love to ask them, would you mind telling me why you do not want a Jesus without the cross. Why you do want a Jesus without the cross, rather. Hear him out. Ask God to give you the opportunity to lovingly share with him the lesson we find in this part of God's word. That Jesus is not a vending machine. That dispenses what we want and to feel good about ourselves. He is the Holy One who came into our world to cleanse us, to fill us, and to change us. To prepare us for eternity. The crowd wanted the Jesus, they wanted to make Jesus king by force, to serve their self-serving agendas. But we must never think that we can put Jesus in some box that suits us. <coughs> he does not deal with us according to our agendas. He will not serve our wayward needs. This means yes. The Jesus that was walking on the water that day came to reveal to us that he's not only the one who can calm the waters. He is the one who made the sea. He is our almighty creator. He is the Lord of life. And because he made us, 
We are to serve his eternal agenda, not our self-serving agendas. You know, the word, the word of God says to us, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. See, Jesus loves us too much to merely make us comfortable and happy in this life. Yeah? It doesn't mean that he doesn't care for our everyday needs. He shows that he does by feeding the 5,000. He does care for the things that we care about. But he cares most about the things that we do not care about. He came to transform what we are living for. We must get that. That is what Jesus wants to show the disciples through this miracle of him walking on the water. And so that being the case, he wants to change what we are living for. There, he will not give us as we think we need always, but rather he will give us what he knows we need. They wanted a king who will improve their living situation. But the Messiah king they needed was the one who died for all. So that those who live should no longer live for themselves. But for him who died for them and was raised again. We all have to come to grips with that truth. And one way that we show that we are coming to grips with that good truth is that we no longer grumble, but we start giving thanks when things don't go our way. When you see somebody doing that, you know they got a handle on this truth. <laughs> when we look back at our time on earth, we'll be surprised to look back and see that some of those hard times, those desperate hours that we went through, turn out to be some of the best times. In this sense, that it was in those hard times, in those desperate hours, that we, were, that we grew, that our roots went down into these great truths. And we learned and we were stretched that it is safe to trust God. Even when we don't understand. You know, Jesus has the power to give us a comfortable life here on earth. Yes? There are times when he stole the storm like he did in this instant that we read. But he doesn't use his power always to do that. Just think about John the Baptist. He wasn't delivered from Herod's sword. I was sitting yesterday with Sally uh, at one of your coffee shops. You've got some very nice ones in town. I'm not going to advertise for them, but anyway. But near the coffee shop where we were sitting, there was a healthy, very healthy looking lemon tree. And I looked at this lemon tree on closer inspection, I could see that this lemon tree at some stage were really cut back. It was severely pruned. And the result of all of that, what was it? A beautiful, beautiful lemon tree full of yellow, healthy lemons. Maybe you would know, as I do, brothers and sisters in Christ, who despite huge hardships, and great ongoing difficulties have not settled into bitterness or hopelessness or self pity used in God's eternal purposes here on earth. You know people like that? You know, as I grow older, you might have noticed, and more frail, I often look at people who have gone before me, who have run this race, both men and women, some of them have died now. And it's through them 
their life stories that God keeps on saying to me, nothing will ever change who I am and what I've done for you. Nothing will ever change who I am and what I've done for you. Nothing will ever change who I am and what I've done for you. Get all of that. <coughs> One such person that have inspired me to think like this has been Corritin Boom. And in the author of the book, The Life Lessons from the Hiding Place, he tells how Corritin Boom, after she was released from that concentration camp in Ravensbrück, how she rode her bike through the streets and the suburbs to bring the message that when the worst things happen in the life of a child of God, the best is yet to be. And during that time, as she went about telling her story, she told it to one very significant person. The Dutch collaborator who betrayed her family by tipping off the Germans. He had been arrested and brought to trial and was sentenced to death. His name was Jan Vogel. And Cory wrote him the following letter. Dear sir, I heard today that you are very probably the person who betrayed me. I went through 10 months in a concentration camp. My father died in the prison after 10 days and my sister Betsy after 10 months. That which you meant for harm, God meant for good to me. I have come closer to him. A severe punishment is awaiting you, sir. I've prayed that the Lord will accept you if you turn to him. Remember that the Lord Jesus bore your sins too on the cross. If you accept that and want to be his child, you will be saved for eternity. I have forgiven you for everything. God will forgive you too if you ask him. He loves you and have sent his son Jesus to earth to pay the price for your sins and to bear the punishment for your sins and for my sins. You need to give him an answer to that. When he says, come to me, give me your heart, then your answer must be, yes, Lord, I want to. Make me your child. If you find it difficult to pray, ask God to give you his spirit. He will give you faith to do so. Never, never doubt the love of our Lord Jesus. He is willing to receive you with outstretched arms. And then the next sentence was so telling. I hope that the deep path you now must take will work towards your eternal Salvation. Yours sincerely, Corretin Boom. Friends, God can and has delivered us from many of life's trials. But when He allows some to come into our lives, it is for our eternal good and to bring about His eternal purposes in the lives of others. Can I sum up what I've been trying to tell you? The disciples went from the mountaintop experience of feeding 5,000 people with Jesus to the valley of a violent storm as they struggled across the sea without Jesus being with them. But Jesus knew, but just as Jesus knew what he would do in the feeding of the 5,000 when he said, when he looked and he saw the great crowd coming towards him, he said to Philip, where shall we buy bread for these people to eat? 
He asked us, the Bible says, only to test him. For he already knew what he had in mind to do, what he was going to do. Likewise, Jesus knew that he was sending the disciples into the storm. And that in that storm he would come to reveal himself in a way to them that they would have never been able to appreciate it as they did in that moment. To bring to them a full understanding of who he is. And it was safe to trust him. I do not know what storms, trials you have faced, are facing, and still have to face. But as you sit here, I want to assure you from God's word, Jesus is not asleep in heaven. He knows all about you. I don't know all your names. I try every week. You know, I've got an old trick. I say to some people, what's your name? And they say to me, my name is Rieder. I say, not the Rieder. No, they tell me, my name is Ruth. And I say, no, no, I'm talking about Ruth. What is your surname? So I get it up confused. But anyway, here we go. I don't know what trials and storms you've been through, what you will go through, and what you are going through. Jesus does. And you know what? He is praying for you. Even he was praying for the disciples while we were fighting against that storm. And having you found in life, I can certainly tell you moments in my life when I were in the middle of a storm, things didn't, life didn't make sense to me. I didn't know. And then just as I thought I was going over the top, he stepped in. Jesus stepped in. But he doesn't always step in like that. We know that as well. And that will be for a purpose that one day maybe he will show us. I say, come, let me show you that. And I, oh, Lord, now I see. But nothing happens to you and me apart from his sovereign, loving care and will. When we, you know, I was again looking at your shops and I saw a sign, an Easter sign. It says this, um, Easter special. I wonder what that Easter special was. I wonder whether they just didn't put it up to get you into the shop to buy things. But anyway, Easter special. For many people, the Easter special that they have lived their life for turns out to be, in the end, just empty Easter eggs wrappings. But there is the special that God brings to us. is a priceless gift of himself in Christ Jesus. We want us to come to know and trust and treasure through the many ups and downs in life as our creator, as our savior, and as our Lord. You know, I pray that through it all, one day, when you look back, you, see, you would see men, there was much evidence in your life how, how the Lord have helped you to turn from fear to faith. To turn, to rely more and more on Him as a result of the many things that you experience and are experiencing in life. And the end result of that. May it help you May I cause you one day to join in, I saw this morning as we sing in some of the songs, a great multitude that nobody can count singing some of those songs. Can you imagine being in one of them? It will be amazing to be, to be singing, but what will be even more amazing that I'll be in that crowd? That's grace. On the crouch, let's hear what he had to say. Put it like this. I thank God for the mountains. And I thank him for the valleys. And I thank him for the storms he had brought me through. For if I never had a problem, I wouldn't know that God could solve them. I would never know what faith in his word could do. Through my many sickness, pain, sorrow and shame, through it all, I've learned to trust in Jesus. Through it all. I've learned to trust in God 
through it all, I've learned to depend upon his word. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that when you put your hand upon us, when you placed your hand upon us in that hour that we first believed, we could never see the road that lies ahead and how we and how you were going to lead us and what we had to go through in life. But we know that the end of life's journey, the one that awaits us, is Jesus. We thank you for that. Amen.